Hi guys, Liam Pickering here. Welcome to Where Do We Begin? Uh, look, what would you say about me? Player agent, old bloke, love my cricket, love my footy. Uh, it's going to be good fun having a chat with the boys. Thanks for that, Liam, and hello and welcome to a brand new episode of Where Do We Begin from me, Harper, and my co-host, Lockie. How are you, Lockie? I'm good, thanks, Harper. It's really good to be in the studio and see your cheeky little face across from me. It's an absolute pleasure. Oh, yeah, this is going to be great. Liam Pickering, uh, tell us a bit about him. Oh, mate, he's just a jack of all trades, you know, football, cricket, uh, sports agent. He's done it all. He's got some absolutely cracking stories, and I'm super pumped to get into the episode. Do you reckon we just get into it, Harps? Yeah, yeah. This is better than anything you could imagine, so let's get into it. Let's dive in. All right, and we have a very special guest today, a man of many, many talents, over 170 Premier Cricket games for North Melbourne, played over 100 games for Geelong and North Melbourne Football Clubs. Uh, He's managed some of the uh, the biggest stars of the game in his role at Precision Sports and, of course, in the media. And we've got him in here for two reasons. One, obviously, to do the podcast, and two, hopefully he'll sign me up as I still reckon I'm a draft chance this year. I've been tearing it up lately. Uh, Liam Pickering, how are you today? I'm well, boys. Uh, Good to be here. Yeah, mate, good to have you on. I've got to say, I quit footy under 12, so you starring in the cricket, starring in the footy, starring in the media, starring as an agent. It's an honour to have you on, mate. No, it's, well, it's good to be here. It's uh, yeah, It's been a fun journey. I've had uh, been lucky with sport, which is you know no doubt different to you but guys, probably when you were kids. You, you hope to make a living out of it, and I've been fortunate enough to do that, which has been good. And uh, before you were absolutely tearing up the football and cricket field, you obviously grew up in Stall, which is an absolutely beautiful place. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Oh, uh, yeah, well, I, I get home as much as possible. I was only home at Easter time, actually. I went up for the Stall gift and the Stall cup and caught up with a few – I got a few really good mates I went to school with and played footy with up there that I'm still really close with. And my mum's still in Stall, so uh, it played, it's very close to my heart, that town. And you go home and – I mean, it's hard at Easter because you get about 30,000 people there at Easter, but you still run into it, a lot of people you know, and it's good to see them all. I don't get up there as much as I'd like to purely because of my AFL commitments – and radio commitments and whatever on the weekends. But, yeah, it is good to get home. Nothing seems to change too much up home. You weren't running the stall gift? <laughs> if you ever saw me run, you'd know damn well I wouldn't be running in the gift. And it's certainly not not at the moment at 50 bloody two years old and, and uh, a hip replacement already and another one to come next week. So I've got a little bit of uh, a little bit of surgery coming up. <laughs> don't worry. Don't look a day over 51. <laughs> well, it's, it's good to know. I'll tell you what, I'm feeling about 61 at the moment. So anyway, but it's, it was good to get home. And, you know, I love growing up up in the bush and, you know, we played a lot of sport, obviously. So my father was a North Melbourne footballer, so I grew up a North supporter and then was lucky enough to get drafted. Yeah, I, I don't know much about Stall, to be honest. I think until a few years ago, I thought it was in WA. But, uh, <laughs> I'm not well, it's focused, a long way from WA, yeah. I can tell you. <laughs> Just pretend you're going to Adelaide, <laughs> go past Ballarat, and you'll, get, you'll have to drive through Stall on your way to Ararat. <laughs> on your, sorry, on your way to Adelaide. Yeah. Now, I'd like to chat just a little, about, a little bit about the gift. Uh, so is that like just the biggest thing? Uh, over there uh, every year, obviously, around Easter time, like you were saying. Is it like, obviously, talk of the town at the time, but you looking forward to it all year? Is it that kind of thing? Yeah, it is. Because last year, because of COVID, they didn't have it. So, mm. But it's one of the oldest professional foot running races in the world and um, I think it's still the richest. So the prize money's still there for the winner. Um, it's great. It's, look, it's a three-day carnival, really. Um, it's Saturday, Sunday, Monday with Friday being the call of the card where they all the bookies get up there and they put the bloody bets on and all the rorts happen with the with the, blo- the blokes that have been running dead for, for a year and getting a good mark and all that sort of stuff, which Jason Richardson did when he won it. He got himself a good mark, Richo, who everyone would know from Channel 7's racing and cricket and all that sort of stuff. So he won a stall gift. But, uh, look, it's, it's a fa- fabulous weekend. And then they've wedged in the, the stall racing cup. So the Stall Cup itself, the, the horse racing's on the Sunday, so that becomes a really big day. So there's, I think there was a couple of thousand, three or four thousand maybe even there when I was up there a couple of weeks ago. So, no, it is a, it's a yeah, it's a big part of the town. We've got the mining up there now as well, so well, it's been up there for years, but that uh, brings a lot of people into the town for, for employment opportunities. So uh, the town's going well. I don't think you can get a rental at the moment in the joint oh, yeah. because uh, – They've been they're, they're they're mining for dark matter at the moment, but don't ask me what dark matter is. I've got no idea. 
But apparently it's, uh, yeah, it's brought a whole lot of people back to town, so you can't get a bloody rental anywhere. That's really interesting. And actually, it's a fun fact, a girl from my year level actually won the, uh, the store gift a couple of years ago. So, um, and yeah, so obviously when you were younger, you would have been, you would have been burning up the, uh, the uh, store central park. Is that what it, the ground yeah, is there? Yeah, that's where they do the gift. And that's our footy ground. And that's our, one of our turf wickets in our cricket competition. So I've spent a lot of time at Central Park. I was there all the time as a kid. Uh, it was a, played a lot of junior footy there and then played senior footy there and was played my only senior premiership actually in my last game for Store, which was before I was drafted. So, um, yeah, yeah, it's a beautiful ground. It's one of the best grounds in country Victoria, but um, I'd be, it would be a fantastic venue for for the country AFL games when they go to the country in the preseason. But because of the gift, they can't play games there because obviously they've got to have it so short and it'd be too hard to play an AFL game on because the Store boys don't get to play there till. Maybe I think their first home game's about three weeks, four weeks after Easter. So they have to play away around that time, which is um, you know, it doesn't give them a great advantage for the for the Wimmera League, but um, it just brings so much money into the town. The store yeah. gift. Yeah. So it's, it's big. Lockie and I were actually chatting to a few of our inside sources before the show, and we actually found out that they named New York Central Park after the one in store. It's that iconic. <laughs> <laughs> it's <a cracker. laughs> yeah, I don't reckon if you asked too many people in New York where Central Park in Australia was, they'd have any idea, but. Uh, I've been to Central Park in New York. That is uh, that is a little bit different than Central Park <laughs> in, in little country town in few more Western tourists. Victoria. Just a few. <laughs> and, yeah, I guess I was sort of touching on it before. So, obviously, you would have been absolutely burning up the ground at stall, at stall in the uh, midfield. But that wasn't the only thing you were uh, burning up. It was there also a potential incident now where you burned down the hospital. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you have done some research. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, well, one, I wasn't playing in the midfield when I was at Store. If you can believe it, I was playing full forward as a junior and then centre-half forward. So I was actually drafted to North Melbourne as a centre-half forward. But the hospital incident wasn't my doing, but I was in, I was right in the middle of it. But, uh, yeah, we were kids playing with matches. And, yeah, my grandfather and grandmother lived at the bottom of the hospital hill and my mate and I um, decided, well, I don't know why we were doing it, but we were flicking matches to each other. It was a stinking hot day. Anyway, one that fair to say that they got away from us the fire. And the fire brigade was uh, was called in. My grandfather was trying to put it out with his hose. It got away from him, and the fire brigade came. And geez, we we, we took off, of course, as kids do. We're only bloody twelve or thirteen, and uh, yeah, yeah, we sat on the top of a, a slide set, you know, swings and slides at the top of the street. I lived at the top of the street where my grandparents did, and. We sat there and watched the hill burning, thinking, oh, what have we gone and done? But luckily the store fire brigade, they got there on time and we were able to put the damn thing out before it got to the hospital itself, which was, uh, yeah, which was a, a very thankful moment for us, I can tell you. Yeah, running muck in country WA, love to hear it. Um, <laughs> uh, we want to talk a bit about your cricket. We hear you, we spoke about it earlier on the show, you're a cracking cricket player growing up. So... How close were you to making the big time, do you reckon, uh, playing cricket growing up? Oh, look, I don't know. I mean, I came to Melbourne to play cricket. So I, I was actually – I travelled for a year when I was still living in store and, and you know, play, and going to school. I, I travelled down. I, was, I originally started at Carlton, played a couple of years there, had a game uh, – a couple of years in the thirds and seconds and then was drafted and then a year after I, I had a year back in the bush playing cricket because I love playing and – yeah, and then North Melbourne Cricket Club because I was there all the time. I was already at Arden Street. They, they they'd heard that I'd, you know, had, I'd been making a few runs in the bush, so they invited me down. And then, yeah, I was able to get straight into the into the first eleven and and pretty much stayed there and and loved it. I loved every minute of it. I got in the state squad in ninety two ninety three. I understand you've had Merv uh, in here as one of your guests. So Merv was obviously in the. <laughs> he was one of the main players in the team. He was a test player at the time. Um, but oh, it was a fantastic experience. I mean, I don't know how close I would have got, but it was good to be a part of that group when you're looking at some of the big names that were in there at the time. And, I mean, there was huge names, Dean Jones and Merv Hughes and Shane Morn and Damien Fleming, Paul Rifle, Simon O'Donnell, you name it. We had, a, we had an unbelievable side. And so. Liam Pickering as well. Don't, well, I was one of, that name. <laughs> to be fair, I was one of the shit kickers in the team. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I, I came in at the same time, actually, as a, as a lot a lot of good young ones that went on to become great players. Yeah, Matthew Elliott and um, these sort of guys. So Simon Cook, who played for Australia as well. Um, and then the younger ones below, below us were like Ian Harvey and, and Brad Hodge and, and these sort of guys. So it's great, great to have played against them. And I love playing district cricket because – you're playing against great players every week, especially when I first started. Every every team you'd play, 
you'd play Footscray and you'd have Merv opening the bowling with Tony Dotter, mate, and you'd play Richmond, it'd be Paul Rifle and David Saker and didn't matter who you were playing against, as a as a top order batsman, you were getting a you were getting a good workout every week, which was a real challenge. And obviously you like the uh, your AFL club North Melbourne was comfortable with you playing with you like playing cricket at the same time. Yeah, they, they were all right. I mean, they I, I just had to make sure that I mean I wasn't playing the full year every year. And I was lucky that I was at a club where they allowed that, a, a career club. Because basically, yeah, I, I'd I'd miss games because I'd have preseason games. Like mm. So I'd play. I might play the first week, and then the second week I'd have a you know an Ansett Cup game or whatever it was. So, um, but because I wasn't setting the world on fire at North, I don't think Wayne Chimwell really cared to be perfectly honest. <laughs> he thought, oh, well, he's not going to really worry us too much in the senior side. But when I went down to Geelong, I'd already been given the flick by North, and then Geelong asked if I was keen to come down there. You know, Bloody was wanting to get me down as part of a trade, and I just said, look, I'm in the state squad, and I, I, to be perfectly honest, I don't think I'm good enough, and then Blighty said, well, come down, you know. Oh, no, I said, I'll, I'll come down and meet Malcolm Blight. This was to Stephen Wells. And Blighty said, well, I'm telling you, I think you're good enough, and I'll do, I'll ring up the coach of the state team and have a chat with him, and he knew him, Les Stillman, who was a South Australian bloke, who was the Victorian cricket coach, and he basically said, well, I'll let him go and play cricket through the summer, and he doesn't have to do his pre-season with us. He can do it with you guys. And so my first pre-season footy year at Geelong, I hardly got to know the players because I wasn't really there. Because I was playing cricket, mm. yeah. which was fun. I mean, I enjoyed it, but yeah, after a year, I mean, I realised that footy was probably going to go be the right direction for me. And whilst keep I kept playing um, district cricket, I was never going to be in the state team after that. Yeah, and I guess just quickly, so obviously being drafted to North Melbourne, which you uh, talked about before, your dad played. Your dad played for North. It was the team that you went for growing up. How special was it to be picked up by them? Yeah, it was. It was enormous for me. I mean, I. Yeah, you know, I was one of the only North supporters in town. Me and the guy that started the fire on the Hospital Hill we were the only two I knew. In Stall, the rest of them barrack for everyone but North because we were Stall's and Est. It's in the Wimmera is basically an Eston and Collingwood area, so a lot of Eston players came out of the Wimmera. But how it was broken up in that Wimmera league that I, I played in, I grew up in, was every team in the Wimmera was Eston and except for Stall and Ararat. For some reason, we were Collingwood, but Collingwood didn't want to have a bar me as a zone player. And I wasn't interested in the zone anyway. And then they got rid of the zone. So North Melbourne liked the Wimmera players for some reason because they took Craig Scholl and Alistair Clarkson was a bit further up. He's Caniver. Um, and me and Brad Scholl and Shane Brewer down the track and a few others. So there was a bit of a Geelong feel to the Wimmera. And when we got down and we knew a few of the guys there at Geelong when I got there, but not at North Melbourne, sorry, um, there were a few of the guys there that I already sort of knew as kids. Um it's funny, some of those guys ended up at Geelong anyway, but, yeah, there was, seemed to be a lot of swapping at the time. But, yeah, North was a great – yeah, it was great for me. I mean, I got to play with some of my heroes. Like, I mean, the Cracker Brothers and these sort of guys, I, I grew up idolising. So, um, no, it was, it was a fantastic experience. Yeah, I want to dig in even deeper into the footy in just a sec, but one more question on the cricket before it's even more too late. Um, so, of course, you work in footy now, but – what, what's your bigger passion in terms of watching cricket or footy these days? Yeah, I, look, I, my team's in, in order. Um, it's funny, I only just did this not long ago on our radio show. Is that if I had to pick teams to watch on television right now, the number one team is Australian cricket team playing test cricket. Number two is Geelong. Number Good three, man. Number three are the Renegades. Yeah. That's, they're my teams. So, I mean, only Renegades because I had an involvement on the board for seven years, but... It's been a tough watch the last couple of years since <laughs> since we've all left the board, um, but yeah, look, they're, they're the three t- things. If they're on telly, I'll, that's I'll be watching that, and that's that's all I'll be watching. Um, but it's a fifty fifty for me. I mean, I mean, I love footy, obviously. I love watching footy, but I love watching cricket too. So I feel they're the two sports that I think I know a bit about. And horse racing, oh, everyone thinks they know a bit about horse racing until you look in your betting account, but. Um, most of the other sports, I mean, I'm only a novice at, so as in watching it and commenting on it and all that sort of stuff. So, but they're the two real passions of mine. I pretty you, equal, actually. I reckon you've been quite modest saying you'd be a novice at, though, because you're a pretty <laughs> yeah. handy football, pretty handy cricketer. I reckon you'd probably be all right at most sports yeah, that you are. Put, put your mind to. <laughs> I don't I guess, know about that. <laughs> get out on the hockey field, the lacrosse field, the oh, pool table. Leave me, out, leave me out of hockey. <laughs> no, 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 I couldn't go. I didn't know. I, I understand the game, but I just was never any good at it. <laughs> We had a go at all those yeah. as a kid, you know. Yeah. You play every spot. I loved basketball as a kid. Played a lot of basketball, but yeah, you wouldn't uh, 
didn't really have the athletic tools to be any good at that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so after 22 games at North Melbourne in five years, you obviously, like you said before, Bidey uh, gave you a call and you made the move to to Geelong. Was it a big blockbuster trade to get you over the line? Yeah, the yeah. You're front right. front page, back page of the Herald Sun. <laughs> yeah, it was a, yeah, yeah, until – I think Reese Palmer went to Carlton about three years ago. It was the worst ever tra- draft. <laughs> well, it was the highest ever pick. Pick 123? Uh, or, is that or right? lowest ever pick, whichever way you want to look at it. <laughs> I think we got traded and it was a package deal as it turned out. Lee Tudor, who was one of my best mates, myself and Darren Steele for, I think it was pick 125 in the draft, <laughs> which they re- used to redraft a bloke they'd got from Geelong, Marty Christensen, who I'd already played with at a year at North, who they'd taken off the list because of an knee injury. So... Uh, and Geelong did quite well out of it in the end. Um, Geelong did well out of North Melbourne, as a matter of fact, with the players <laughs> they picked up. Um, yeah, they all actually ended up being much better players at, at Geelong than they were at North. Yeah, yeah. And Geelong, you experienced a fair bit of success, never that ultimate glory, but 94 prelim, great game, uh, a bit before our times, but uh, it's an absolute cracker, goal after the siren, I believe. Geelong and North, was it? Yep. You tell us about that. That, that, that was been pretty amazing. Well, it was the best game of footy I ever played in. Um, it was just such a cracking game. Yeah, they, we'd gone in. We'd had a couple of, uh, well, sort of close wins really to get to the to get to the prelim. I mean, we were a team that it took us a while to get in in the eight that year or the six or whatever it was. I can't even remember. I think it was a top six actually. And we'd been up and down a bit all year. The Cats. Got to the – we had to win like the last two games to make the finals. We ended up making it. We played Footscray in the first final. Uh, Billy Brown has kicked that famous goal after the siren to get us through to the next week. Carlton were the premiership favourites. They went in premiership favourites to the finals and then they got beaten by Melbourne in the first final, uh, yeah, which was an upset. So when they, we, we then had to go out to Waverley and beat Carlton or play Carlton without Couch, Bearstow and Hocking and Michael Mansfield, who was All-Australian that year, who'd – busted his ribs or punched his lung or something the week before. So in a real upset, we knocked them over out at Waverley, which sent us to the prelim against North, against all our old mates. And it was a cracking game. North got away to a huge start. They were all over us early. Carey was on fire. It was, And then we dominated, totally dominated the second and third quarters. And we were running out of gas at 100 mile an hour and North were all over us in the last quarter, got in front and then somehow we got the ball into our forward line because we couldn't get it past the wing. North were just defending like geniuses. We somehow got it over the end of the forward line and it comes down to the last few seconds and Lee Tudor, firstly, Johnny Barnes misses a soda of a mark, which was unlike him because he's a great player. It goes and then Lee Tudor sweeps on the ball in the pocket. My little mate and squares it up and Gary Ablett takes a mark with two seconds to go with the scores level at the top of the goal square. Oh, it was, and the crowd were going nuts. The, the siren went. All they had to do was score, and we were through to the grand final. And I'd never been to the grand final. It was my second year at the club. So it was a great thrill for us to know that our, our dreams as kids, like you guys as young blokes, would have dreamt about playing in an AFL grand final, and that's all I'd done. And we knew that if we, all Gary had to do was score from 15 metres out and we were into the grand final. That's that's really special. And obviously, I guess, playing at North Melbourne, you would have played with Kerry. Playing at Geelong, you would have seen Gary Abbott. You've seen them both up close. Who, who do you rate as a better player? I uh, hope. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> I had this discussion with with my North blokes, you know, all my North mates over having a beer. Who's the best player you've ever seen? And all the North blokes say, Wayne Kerry. I said, no, nah, Gary Ablett. So, oh, well, who would you pick first? I said, well, it's a different question. Gary Ablett, to me, is the most special footballer I've ever seen. Like, he could do stuff that even Duck could only dream of, really. For a guy who, who didn't train a lot, he was just so naturally talented, he had everything. But Wayne Carey is a super team player, was a superstar player. So I feel blessed to have played with both of them. When I was at North, Duck was still a young guy, just hadn't quite got there. His breakout year actually came the year that I, my first year at Geelong. He was starting to show it in 92, but 93 was when he really broke out and started to become the dominant force. Gary Senior was a dominant force from the minute he got to Geelong in 84. So, do you, do you reckon Wayne broke out? Because obviously you were a centre half forward as a young guy. Oh, I wasn't because, playing centre half you weren't in front of him. <laughs> I think North Melbourne would have been real disappointed if they looked at the draft. The draft thing that came through and has a little spiel on each player is North Melbourne picked up, you know, with pick 48 or whatever it was, a centre half forward from Stall, 184 centimetres. <laughs> <laughs> I reckon the North supporters, who's this centre-half forward from still Jitty Small? 
But that was the difference, I guess. Now I was a midfielder at North. Um, but the Duck, yeah, no, he was a fantastic champion player. And, and Gary was just something special. He was just, he, as I said, could do stuff that I don't, I don't think I've ever seen and I don't think I'll ever see anyone ever do again. Yeah, and moving from North to Geelong, North, you – probably weren't fully, like, embedded into the side, playing week in, week out uh, across your time there, five or six years or something like that. Um, but when you're in Geelong, you're just having kind of success all the time, making grand finals, playing most games. So what was the difference, do you reckon? Do you reckon it was just perfectly suited club at the Cats that you went to? Yeah, I th- well, I think at the time it was. I mean, I didn't think I'd get a game, and I said that to Malcolm Blight. I said, oh, no, I'm not going to get a game. I can't get a game in North Melbourne's midfield. And, you know, they finished – 10th, and you guys played in the grand final in 1992, and you've got Couch, Bear, Star, Hocking, and all these blokes. And Bly just looked at me and said, well, I'm telling you, you're going to play. I'm the coach. I picked the team. Anyway, so he gave me a chance, and that's all I could ever – I could never thank him enough for giving me the, the opportunity to actually do that, uh, to get down there and have a bit of a go, and, and that's all it was. And then was lucky enough to – he gave me runs of games too. He just didn't – North it became a bit of an in one week, out the next, playing the, in the reserves in the middle – you know, play on the ball, get picked in the senior team, they play in the forward pocket out of the play a bit. And I wasn't really a natural forward pocket. I'd been playing midfield for too long once at that stage. Um, yeah, so, yeah, Geelong just backed me in and gave me opportunities. And when times early in my days at Geelong, a couple of games I could have got dropped, he kept me in and just gave me a little bit of self-confidence and a little bit of belief. So, yeah, I thank Malcolm Blight for that. And then Gary Ayers took over and I, I really liked the way Ayers he coached. He coached a, a, a pretty straightforward way, is if you did the right things from a team perspective, you, you know, you, you're going to get looked after. And, and I, I found him to be a really good coach as well. Yeah, I completely get that. I feel like a lot of players, even to this day, they get drafted at midfielders and they get forced to play in a small forward role and then coaches can't work out why they're not performing to mm, necessarily yeah. their high pedigree, but it's such a specialist position. And we touched on the 1994 prelim before, but I'd also like to talk a bit about the 1995 prelim against the, the Mighty Tigers <laughs> out, out at Waverley. Yeah. And uh, I guess d- during our research came across something. So you were a bit late to the game. Is that? Jeez, you have done research. <laughs> oh, unbelievable research. Yeah, well, we were oh, – it was funny because it was a wet day. I don't know if you remember the game. You were probably too young. You wasn't – weren't born. <laughs> oh, you weren't born. So there you go. You, were, you, weren't, you were too young. Um, so what happened was I lived in Melbourne. I never travelled. I never moved to Geelong. So for eight years I played there, I travelled, you know, because we weren't full-time then. We were, I had a sales rep, Joel, I was selling bloody carpets. And Lee Tudor was in Melbourne – uh, I think he moved down the second year. He moved down at the end of 94, I reckon, which was the end of his second year. Um, and so, oh, no, actually, no, he was, anyway, long story, but he was he was in Melbourne. Uh, and I, he stayed with his parents or something the night before. I said, oh, well, I'll pick you up and we'll go together. And it was pouring rain. The Southeastern Freeway back then going out to Waverley was a bloody, they used to call it the Southeastern Car Park. And I thought, oh, well, the traffic's going to be, Pretty average. That's my area of selling carpets. I know, I know the area. <laughs> I'm going to take us the, the quick way. Anyway, so we roll out there, and I go the Eastern Freeway and cut along Springvale Road, and I've got this sneaky back way. And well, the traffic was absolutely diabolical. And the Friday night, because the cats used to get the bus up to the game. Anyway, the Friday night, Gary is or the Thursday night train. Gary is said, "Look, we're going to meet for a pre-game chat on the ground at you know." 12.30 or 12 o'clock or something like that, you think. Anyway, Lurker and I, Lee Tudor and I rolled up. <laughs> the meeting was finished. <laughs> we walked in the rooms and I'm thinking, oh, this is not a good start, not a good start. We've missed the whole teams on the ground except me and Tudor. Anyway, we walk in the rooms and Brad Scholl, who's <laughs> one very funny bloke, he just looks at Lurker and I and he said, oh, you two better get a kick. <laughs> <laughs> Where have you been? <laughs> anyway, as he walks up and I said, oh, sorry, I'm bloody caught up in traffic. He said, which way did you go? I said, oh, I thought we were doing the smart thing. <laughs> we went Eastern Freeway. He goes, no, the South East was pretty good today. I said, oh, well, yeah. Said, sorry, mate. He goes, no, you'll be right. Just get a kick. Hey, what, what would happen if that happened nowadays in, like, 2021? Oh. Like, if a player rocked up late to a game, would they be? Well, we weren't late to the game, though. What, what, like, I mean, oh, you know what I mean? Yeah. The game didn't start till 2.30. Yeah, so. yeah. Yeah, we just missed the initial yeah. on ground where we were going to stand around and talk about yeah. stuff before we went in and got yeah. warmed up and all that sort of uh, stuff. So, <laughs> well, we were there for the actual rev up. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, 10 minutes before we ran out, uh, I was there for that. We just happened to miss the initial, you know, one where we just get together and have a bit of a chin wag. But, 
yeah, that was uh, that wasn't ideal, I must say. And <laughs> geez, we felt bad getting in. We were rushing to the green, you know, it's like, and then we couldn't. The car park attendant, you know, he wasted ten minutes trying to tell us where to go. Oh, it's a sh- bloody shit show, really. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, in the Premier League, Arsenal this season, uh, their big derby against Tottenham, uh, their captain and star player uh, was caught in traffic. Uh, it was a bit late. Uh, rocked up a bit past the time he was meant to, and he got dropped. So oh, there you yeah, go. Well, no, luckily, I mean, the coach is actually really good. I mean, back in the day, you'd get screamed at. But, I mean, the first thing you don't do, well, the thing you don't do when a person walks in if they're late is abuse them for being late because you mm. don't know what's happened. Mm. Like, they could have had a car accident. They could have been – and back then, we weren't rolling with mobile phones. Yeah. It's not like I could have rang the team manager, you know, from a bat phone. I didn't have a car phone and I didn't have a mobile. So none of us had mobiles in 1995, which you guys won't be able to believe, but <laughs> – we didn't walk around with mobiles on it the whole time, I must say, which was interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mentioned before, not quite getting into that ultimate glory, not quite tasting that sweet, sweet honey, I guess, of premiership glory. Yeah, well. <laughs> that was, uh, pretty disappointing, I guess. Two, two Where, losing grand finals. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. Thanks for that. <laughs> and they were both buildings too. We weren't close in either of them. Like we got pumped in 94 by a better team, West Coast, and then – we had a stinker in 95. Like, we really had a bad day. It was – I mean, we'd played against Carlton during the year. I think there was about a six-point advantage to them at high, at their joint at Princess Park. So there wasn't a lot between the teams, but on the day we were just putrid. Like, so bad, so bad. Um, and it, it was so disappointing. And then I thought the year we could have we, – we would have won it was 97, and we sort of got a bit stiff in the finals. We copped North Melbourne. We finished second, and we copped North Melbourne. It was seventh under lights at the MCG on a Sunday night, the only ever Sunday night final I've ever played, yeah. in the driving rain, and Wayne Carey, I think he kicked seven out of about nine, 10 or nine or ten they kicked, or 11 maybe. But he kicked seven, and was and we had all the play, but we just couldn't score. We lost a couple of in- players with injury that night. and Then we went to Adelaide the following week, um, again, which I don't know how they ended up getting a home final against us, considering we'd finished second. But how does that work? Oh, it was a weird system back then. It was 1v8, 2v7. Oh. But how we ended up in Adelaide, considering they finished four, fifth, I think. And anyway, and we'd finished second, it's beyond me. But um, we ended up over there and they beat us by, I don't know, eight or eight, ten points, I guess. And Lee Colby, that's that famous one where Colby took a great mark in the third quarter and probably 30 metres out directly in front and down by didn't pay the mark. Oh. And uh, it's a famous Lee Colby mark, which was courageous as you'd ever see. And it would have given us a good little buffer and it would have made it a little bit harder for them to beat us. But in the end, we had our chances. We weren't good enough. Razor Ray wasn't running around back then. No, it wasn't (laughs) wasn't Razor Ray. It was Grant Vernon without name. No, it was Grant Vernon. Uh, He just missed it. He was on the wrong side. We just couldn't understand why he didn't pay it. It was a clear chess mark. Yeah. Well, a great mark. I don't know if you've ever seen it, but fantastic. Running with the flight of the ball, just courageous. But um, anyway, he still still would have to kick the goal, but he would have, I think, from 30 metres directly in front. And... He was a very good player, Lee Colbert. And um, and that was the end of our season, which was disappointing. Crows went on to win their first flag. Mm, we'll chuck that video on the socials at WDWB Pod on Instagram and Twitter. Oh. And where do we begin on Facebook, of course? So check those out. Uh, but moving into your sports management career. So what what was the kind of allure of becoming a sports manager? Why did you get into it? Well, I was sort of – I fell into it, really. I mean, I, I'd finished playing um, in 2000. I went and coached at the Western Jets in 2001, and I was really enjoying that. And that was the direction I wanted to go. I really wanted to coach. And Johnny Longby is one of my best mates. He was at IMG doing the the player management. IMG is the international management group. It's the biggest management company in the world. And it's, you know, and they had an AFL division, which John was was heading up um, as an AFL player. And he got approached by the Swans at the end of 2001 to go, go up there under Rodney Eden and be an assistant coach and he thought the management wasn't from him. He, for him, he'd done it for a couple of years. but So he took that opportunity, and I remember talking to him about it. And my sister was working at IMG at the time, doing corporate hospitality. And so I knew a bit about the company, and I'd met, I'd met the boss a couple of times and got along well, and just through John socially. And he approached me out of the blue and just sort of said, um, you know, I want to offer you the job. And I sort of said no. I said no originally. And he came back to me three or four weeks later and asked again and, yeah, put a better case forward, and um, I ended up giving it thought I'd give it a go, and I'll stay, keep coaching as well. But you worked out pretty quick you couldn't do both because the weekends you're really going to be full doing other stuff. So with the management with the management company, so that's how I got into it. I just fell into it really. 
Yeah, a real sliding doors moment because it obviously it's great that you've done that because you've come, gone on to become one of the most prominent agents in the industry. And I'm really interested, what does your job actually entail? I guess, what, what do you actually do as a sports agent? Well, it's a whole range of different things for, from helping, obviously recruiting players and, and then negotiating contracts and, and endorsement deals, but, you know, helping them off the field with things like, you know, their finances and, you know, family things, you know, helping them get a car, just getting players set up, houses, you know. But so you sort of do a lot with the players. Uh, and it's it's things I really enjoy. Um, you do a lot, deal a lot with recruiters, list managers, um, CEOs in some cases, um, so general managers of footy and and that's who you're dealing with all the time. The recruiters are really important. Uh, and then, of course, you've got to have your relationships with the, with the various, you know, whether it's TAC clubs or whether it's, regional managers or whatever it may be at, at, at the under-18 level and the junior level and the pathway program. So it's an all-encompassing sort of job. But, I mean, it's funny, everyone I talk to that, that wants to get into the field, I think it's the most exciting job going around. Well, it's got some downside, don't worry. It's not It's not all beer and Skittles, I can tell you that. You get the late-night phone calls, someone's got a bloody blue or been locked up or whatever it may be and <laughs> – or someone's going to court or, you know, they've got themselves in trouble or whatever whatever it is. I mean, you, you are putting out a lot of spot fires as well. It's it's much better these days because the players are much more disciplined than they used to be, but uh, early days are some f- pretty hairy moments. Yeah, it's inter- it's interesting you touched on that pathway earlier. So just say, so I feel like a lot of people who um, they love sport, they want a career in sport, and I'm sure a lot of people like Halfs and I, we realise when uh, – we're not going to make the big time. We weren't going to make it to the big time in yeah. anything. <laughs> so what actually is the pathway into becoming a sports agent? It's not necessarily a set thing. And do you have any advice for people that are looking to get into this field? Um, yeah, well, it's, it's interesting. Like, the amount of people I've sat down with, young fellas that have said, I want to do what you do. And I said, well, you, you, you're not going to do what I do because I was appointed because I was the next player. So you're not going to have that pathway. So you need to go in the educational path, which is a lot what, what they all do pretty much now. There are a few ex AFL players that are now doing it. I see Brett Delidio, I think's joined. Um, he's joined Anthony McConville, one of the other agents. Ramanaskis as well. Adam Ramanaskis doing. Ram has been doing it for yep. a fair while. Alex McDonald, myself. Uh, we have Tom Williams does a bit of stuff with us. Uh, who's playing at the Bulldogs? Nathan Freeman as well. Nathan Freeman's working in the industry as well. So Scott Lucas maybe as well. Is yeah. Scott Lucas involved in it? Scotty as well? Lucas, yeah. yeah, yeah. So there's maybe eight of us that have yeah. played yeah. AFL footy. Um, the young ones that come through have normally come through a path of, you know, like business management or sports management degrees. And I think the sports management degree they seem to go to the most is is at Deakin University, offer a really good one. Um, so if we were looking to put someone on, if it wasn't an ex-player or someone, that a client, because when you've been around as long as we have, I've been doing it for 20 years, but, you know, we know players that are keen to get into the industry that we think would be good. Um, so we have Daniel Daniel Wells does a bit of mentoring with our players as well. He's really good. Um, but just a mentoring thing, he doesn't want to be an all full-time agent. So, um, But, yeah, the amount of people that uh, – there's probably 80 or 90 agents now, which is a lot of agents. There wasn't that many when I started. There was about 30. So a lot easier to get a kid to sign when, you were, when there's only 30 of them. But these poor kids now, doesn't matter how good they are, they're getting letters from bloody 30 different agents, mm. you know, and it's, it, it can be a bit off-putting because they're sending them out to you know, a lot of these guys. I mean, they've, they've got hardly any players and they just send out letters to everybody. Yeah. So you get a lot of kids' hopes up that realistically don't have any opportunity or won't get drafted. They won't have any chance of getting drafted. No, I'm 18 now. You were having a look at pre-show at my kicking form. You nearly threw up. It was shocking. <laughs> but is, am I about the age where you start checking the players out or do you reckon it's a bit earlier even? No, you've got to be younger than that. Yeah, yeah right. We're, we're looking at them in the 16s. Yeah, all right. So some of the, some of the ages look at them even earlier, but – you get a pretty good idea of who the real good ones are. Like there was an under seventeen game last on Friday, just gone, and there was some super talent there. And these kids are not draftable until next year, or in some cases, the year after. So now we're already looking at the twenty two group, um, the twenty one group. We've got a you know number of kids signed already for this year's draft, but the twenty two groups our focus at the moment. Any names you can reveal that might be big stars in the future? Uh, no, nothing that I'm going <laughs> to reveal. It's yeah, because uh, yes, yeah, pressure. Just the kids don't really know. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's enough talk about them. I mean, there's, you know, 20 years ago, you wouldn't have known who the kids were coming through. I mean, the general public wouldn't until they get drafted. But, you know, we all knew. But now they've got Draft Central and they've got shows on it and there's trade radio and there's draft and it's the NAB, NAB leagues, you know, they've, they've, you know, all being filmed and whatever. So, no, there's enough There's enough pressure on these kids as it is. So, And they're trying to do their studies. That's the other thing. They're trying to do year, year, 
11 and 12, these kids. So you got to be a little bit wary about giving them a little bit of space as well. I think that's important. And obviously, I guess you've managed some of the uh, the biggest names in the game, with one of those being, I'm a Geelong fan, being Gary Ablett Jr. I guess, can you tell us a little bit about what it was like working with Gaz and I guess watching him grow up? Because obviously being teammates with senior, you would have seen Udo Ablett Jr. in the rooms as a youngster and then you get, grew up and watched him turn into a great player, but not only that, a great person as well. Yeah, he's a beauty. Like, I mean, I've got a huge amount of time and respect for Gary. Um yeah, I remember him as a little kid. He was a, he was a cheeky little bugger. He was in the rooms. He was always – him and Nathan were always eating all our chewies and <laughs> just – yeah, they're, but they are so skillful as kids even. It was unbelievable how talented they were. You could just see it, the way they were kicking the balls around the room when they were just little kids. And you knew they were going to be good footballers if they wanted to be. But, um, yeah, Gary, I didn't, I didn't have him originally. He was with Gary Senior's manager at the time um, for the first few years of his career and then – um, yeah, I took over, I think, in about 2006 and then had, I've still managed him today. I'll still look after his stuff today. So, yeah, he's, we've been on a long journey together. He's a fantastic person. Um, he's, he can be challenging at times, <laughs> like, you know, but he's, a, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's just one of the most beautiful people you'd ever meet, really. He's just, you, you know, he's always smiling, you know. He's just a nice person and – for a, for a champion player, and he's one of the best players that's ever played the game, I've got no doubt about that. Um, yeah, he's, he's been a delight to manage, really. Mm, and just to shove our great research in your face again, we heard uh, in 2010 in the prelim, uh, the Cats were getting smacked. Gary Abbott was best on ground at three-court time, but Bomber Thompson moved into moved into the forward pocket mm. because he was probably – uh, there was a little rumour that he was going to the Gold Coast, apparently. So you yeah, have done a lot of research. <laughs> I don't know where you're researching this from, but yeah, well, it's that happened. He had he ended up with forty odd touches. He was going to get fifty plus that night, mm. which was enormous. It's not like you're getting your fifty now, where you're counting the kick in from full back. He was the he was the best player on the ground in that game. There's no there's no doubt he was. And if he had a stayed in the middle, he was just he was taking Collingwood on by himself to the stage where we managed Swanee as well and. Swanee said to me, or Pen- might have been Pendles, he said, uh, what happened to Gazza in the last quarter? He was everywhere and then he went, he was in just, we didn't see him. I said, yeah, because he was moved out of the way, basically, because I think Bom- well, Bomber knew he was going to leave, but yeah, we, we didn't know Bomber was going to leave as well. <laughs> but he left at the same time. <laughs> anyway, but uh, yeah, so that's so that did happen, yeah, which was frustrating, but that was probably. You know, that was the reason in the end just Gary decided he was going to go. That was one of the reasons anyway. How, yeah, how did the deal go down with sort of Gold Coast? Was it only sort of between Geelong and Gold Coast that was sort of vying for it? And I guess how close did it come? Because obviously he announced it after the season, but I'm sure it would have been a very difficult decision for him and very difficult for you. Oh, no, he, he, it had been going on for 12 months. So he, he'd made the he'd made the call that he would go there 12 months before. Really? But he made the call he'd go there, but then the whole year was he was trying to change, change his mind and he was trying not to go, he wanted to stay and I just let him go and in the end he, he didn't obviously sign the contract until well after the season. But, um, yeah, he's he, he, he ebbed and flowed and, and, and sort of his, his mind was changing all the time to the stage where oh, I didn't know what, what was going to happen in the finish, and then I just let him, I just said, let, it, let him go because the panic, Gold Coast were panicking and he was their big marquee signing and he was getting cold feet and he and to the stage where he told me a couple of times, you know, I can't do it, I'm not leaving. It's like, oh, well, you've already sort of said you are and you've got an agreement, but anyway, in the end I said, the Suns were panicking, I said, just let him go, let him go, he'll find his own way and sure enough, he found his own way and decided it was a good move for him. He's going to he'd grow up on the way out. You know, go up there and take on the leadership and and really take on the challenge at a, at a new franchise. It didn't work out from a club perspective, but he was unbelievable for him. That's got to be a massive pressure on you to keep it on the down low. That kind of that massive trade, one of the biggest trades in footy history. That's well, I think that that one was probably a bit more out there. The Buddy Franklin one was the best yeah, one to keep yeah, on, on, yeah. on the under the radar because that was the one no one knew was going to happen. Everyone was thinking got the GWS, GWS. Giants. If he didn't sign with Hawthorne, and Hawthorne put, gave us a bit of a deadline, they sort of said, well, he's got to, here's the offer, um, which was nothing like the Swans offer, obviously, but um, and you've got to, you know, we need to know, July 1st or whatever it was, June 30th, um, otherwise we'll have to pull the offer off the table because we'll have to, you know, start looking to sign up other players. Anyway, when I said, well, he's not going to sign on that date, so that was, they sort of knew then, but they were, and they were angling, I think, to get a little bit of compo from the from the Giants and the Giants thought it was going to happen and then 
yeah, we the Swans had put, come to the party behind the scenes and and that's where he ended up going, which caused a huge furor. <laughs> yeah. But he's been great for – he's been so good for Sydney. It's been yeah. fantastic. It's so funny because I feel like everybody knows where players thinking about going months before it happens, like, you know, sort of leaks to the media um, – to the media, how did you keep it so quiet? And also, do you think the deal would have still been allowed to have gone ahead if it was leaked early in the season? No, nah, wouldn't have. Chance? I, I don't think it would have. Personally, I, I think there's no really? way in hell it would have. No, I don't think the AFL. Well, you saw how they reacted when he did go to the Swans. There was all sorts of drama, the investigations, and I'm not sure why there was an investigation. It was the, it was one of the silliest things I've ever been involved in. It was laughable. You know, it wasn't like any skullduggery going on. He was a free agent. He could have been the Swans could have matched the deal. Sorry, Hawthorne could have matched the deal. It would have been he would have been a Hawthorne player, but they weren't going to match the deal. So, I'm not sure why they were, there was they were crying over spilt milk there. They could have because well, we really that wanted him that badly. Well, here you go. We'll match the deal, and he stays a Hawthorne player for the next nine years. Mm. They didn't do that. So, um, yeah, look, it, it was hard. It, it, it was it wasn't hard to keep it under wraps because there was only a few people that knew. And that was what I said from the get-go. If this is going to happen, I said, this is not a whole club discussion because it's not even a cold – you can't even tell the board. So we, we really only had a, a very few number of people. So Buddy and his family obviously knew. Myself and James, who works with me, knew, uh, who I trusted. Um, so that us two and, and Buddy's family. Johnny Longmire uh, knew – the footy manager, Dean Moore, Andrew Ireland and Richard Collis. That's the initial group. And then oh, probably Kenny Beetson, who was the recruiting manager, but because um, he would have been yeah, obviously about from a draft perspective, what was going to affect the other picks and whatever. The other ones that got bought in on it later on were was Jared McVeigh on behalf because they wanted to go to the leadership and make sure they were happy. And so they, they bought Jared McVeigh in on it. That was it, really. Yeah. So... Yeah, it was kept on a down low because Richard didn't tell the rest of the board. He, he, he as the chairman, Richard Collins, he was superb because uh, I said, no, it doesn't matter, anyone, you, you tell a board anything, it's leaking from a board. Boards leak like a mm. leaky boat with a boat with a hole in the bottom of it. They're unbelievable boards. You want to get something, want to get something out there, just tell someone on the board. <laughs> They're the ones that leak everything. <laughs> so, yeah, so it was it was just a needs-to-know basis and, and anyway, got to the stage where – it was half an ambush, and I'm sure the Giants still think it was well, they were ambushed. But anyway, so that's footy. That's how you have to do things sometimes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, did you? Am I correct in saying you managed Gold Coast Matt Shaw? Did you manage Matty Shaw? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, he, we had him on our podcast in I think episode 15, and he told us a little story about uh, his uh, axing from the Gold Coast. Told on his wedding night, there was to list a no on Twitter. Yeah, no, no, thank you for your service. Nothing like that. Really, it was. Bit shambolic. So, do you have any, any memories of the way he was treated? Oh, I didn't. I didn't remember it being like that. I mean, I'd had discussions with him all year about whether he'd get another contract, and yeah, I, look, I'm not a hundred percent sure if that's exactly how it went down. Um, maybe that's how the public messaging was, but no, he was across. Uh, my my understanding was, you know, we were kept across, you know, how it was all how it was all happening and where it was all sitting. Um, but sometimes those things are like, well, we can't give you an answer. To, you want an answer now? I can't give you an answer right now. Hmm. So, you know, nah, we were pushing all year to try and get an extension and find out what was going on. So, um, yeah, it was disappointing uh, for Shorey. I really liked Shorey as a player and um, you know, we ended up at Carlton, had a year there. And um, anyway, he's back living on the Gold Coast. He loves the Gold Coast. Yeah, he does. Yeah, he, he loves his surfing. <laughs> yeah, I listened to that one. It was interesting. He made some comments how he felt more connected to Carlton as a club. They did more things for him necessarily than Gold Coast. And I guess it sort of raises the question, particularly like how difficult it was for Gary Abel to be traded from Gold Coast when he had, you know, real reasons to at the end of um, 2017, I think it was. Like, do you have any thoughts on like Gold Coast, sort of like player management and welfare and how they sometimes oh, handle it? A, it? It's hard to really judge because they were a startup club without yeah. a lot of resources. They didn't have as, as many resources, no, any of the resources they should have mm. should have had. Um, and they had a lot of new people that had never done it before. So, yeah, they were on a hiding for nothing, really. Both the Giants and the, and the Suns when they first were set up because they were set up – with a whole heap of money and from a salary cap perspective for a whole heap of kids because everyone was on the same salary cap, but then they didn't have the resources to develop them. Yeah. So there were a lot of really talented players <clears throat> when they were first started that, that 
didn't become the players they could have been in my view because they just didn't – they lacked the support and off-field support, mm. um, which is what we're seeing at the moment really with the soft cap the way it is, is they're not getting the coaching that they should be getting at the moment players because, you know, that's you know, what happened with COVID and what happened with the cutbacks and all that sort of stuff. So – but that was – it was near impossible for them to do well, those two teams in particular in the first few years. Yeah, I am interested just because while talking about expansion, you know, there's been recent talks about expanding to 20 teams like Tasmania getting a team and stuff. And I felt you'd be as well placed as anybody to know because, you know, you're looking at the upcoming talent, you're looking at the under-16s, the under-18s. Do you think there is enough talent in Australia in the pool to support a 20-team competition with an extra 80 to 90 lists, I guess, players on AFL lists? Oh, purely from a, a selfish point of view, yeah, absolutely. I think we want to see as many young, talented footballers get an opportunity as as we can. I mean, the team, it's expanded from 12 teams when I was a kid to to 18 now. So, you know, Tasmanian team makes sense to me. Um, I don't know about from a financial perspective, it sounds to me like they got their act together and I think it would work. Uh, and you know what? You can see it with Brisbane. Like, kids that, that are in the bush, they're moving. We're, we're, regardless, they're moving. So anyone outside of CBD Melbourne is moving mm. if, they, if they're not playing for one of the teams that are based in Melbourne. Even the kids in Melbourne that go to Geelong, they're all moving. So Brisbane went and made a bit of a, um, you know, had a bit of a play really for country Victorian kids that were talented. Yeah, McLuggage and Berry and these type of guys um, because they knew that, well, it didn't matter. There's no team in Ballarat. We'll go and they're going to move whether it's to Melbourne or not. We might as well get them here and they're good. So I think it's a smart, it was a smart tactic back then. Um, you just then the, the go home factor goes, disappears. So... Yeah, I do think that there there is an opportunity there, um, but they won't want to have a buy, so they'd have to come up with two more teams. Yeah, yeah. Um, something I'm really interested in: what are the most kind of difficult things being a player agent, player manager, and the kind of things that really make you earn, earn your pay? Like, obviously, you don't have to name names. You can give us a bombshell headline if you want, but <laughs> feel free. Like, you don't have to name names. But what are the really difficult things in your job? I trade periods one of the more difficult things because. We saw it last year with Josh Dunkley. I mean, that was that went to the wire and it was a lot of things that were being said and offered and whatever and it doesn't happen and you've got to pick up the pieces with the player that that was wanting the move and, um, and it happened, it's happened before. Not doesn't happen as much as you'd normally, you would think, um, where a player wants to really wants to leave a club and they, you know, and they just won't, won't let him go. Normally there's a deal that can be struck. So that's hard. Um being totally honest with media in particular isn't isn't ideal at times because you end up with a situation um, where I guess sometimes you just can't the, the the media will hound you for answers and you just can't give it to them. It's just like you know you know you're putting your you're putting a deal in in you know uh, in in jeopardy because you, you, if you're telling anyone anything. So I tend to not tell any of the media anything. And it's hard because, I mean, I do media stuff myself, mm. um, you know, whether it's just mainly footy calling and, and that sort of stuff, but also the show with Hutchie and he's a he's a good little newsbreaker and I work in an industry <laughs> where with SEN, I work at – that's our company, yeah. Sports mm. Entertainment Network. So, I mean, the reality is that they're looking to break stories all the time. So yeah. I've got to be a little bit wary about who comes in the office and yeah. <laughs> all that sort of stuff. So, But, look, overall, I mean, every job's difficult. It doesn't matter what you do. There's there's always difficult parts to a job. You just got to adjust and deal with it. Yeah, Josh Junkley's an absolute superstar. Good gifts, Wayne Grammar Boy, too. And I've just got final one final question, sorry, in regards to the management. And you sort of touched on it a little bit before, and it's just about the conflicts of interest because, obviously, you're working in the media as well. Do you ever find that tough? Because, obviously, you have a fiduciary duty to act in your player's best interest, but then you also – it'd be tough on the media and the fact that you'd know a lot of information that, obviously, you're not going to tell because you have confidentiality with the client and you don't want to, like – in that relationship or anything, but do you ever find that tough? Yeah, some of that is tough, yeah, yeah. When when there's a story being broken about your player and you're on air and then you're getting grilled about it, that's that's difficult, you know. So, but you, know, you try and just do your best. I mean, that's all we can be. I mean, I, I don't – when I'm commentating a game and I'm not calling ball by ball, you know, I'm just doing special comments, I, I can be critical on our guys and sometimes they hear it and, <laughs> and laugh – and sometimes they, they might take offence. I don't go super critical on it. anyone, really, though. I mean, it's a tough game. I've, I understand the game. I've played it. So for mine, it's, you know, players aren't deliberately doing stupid things, but they do. Like, that's the reality. That's just a dumb kick. I'm not sure what he was thinking there. You know, 
But mind you, we're sitting up in a, in a, in a bird's eye view of the game. It looks a hell of a lot easier in the commentary box than it does when you're on the ground. So I try not to forget where how hard the game is. Uh, and it's a different game too to what I played. I played in the bloody 90s. So, um, you know, it's a whole different game now. So, But it's good because we made some coaches as well. I get a bit of a feel for what teams are trying to do and that helps, especially when you're broadcasting a game. Mm. Yeah, now there's a whole lot more stuff we could probably chat about. But um, for our last question of our main interview, it's a question that we always ask as the last question to our guests. So you've had a fascinating career, fascinating journey, obviously. Do you have a kind of life philosophy or a quote that's kind of guided your decisions throughout your time? Um, no, not really. I mean, always play up to the best level you can as a sportsman. So play up, don't play down. So don't, you know, if you're a – you can be uncomfortable when you're going up to the next level because you don't know anyone, and that was always my theory: is you know I'm going to I'm going to play up at the highest level I can all the time. So if I say that to players that get delisted from an AFL club, is they want to get go, I'll go back and play with my mates. Well, you're 21, don't do that. Go and play in the VFL. That's the next best level. So you play at the best level you can. That's always been a theory of mine, and. From I guess from a cricket footy perspective is, is and I say I say this to kids as well because I did it. Um, don't be told that you can't. You've got to make a decision when you're 15 or 16. Just don't be told. If you really want to keep playing cricket or you want to keep playing basketball and you're good at both and you're really good and you like them both the same, you'll choose your own direction. You'll find your own way. You don't need to. You don't need to be told that. Well, if you don't, if you give up, um, if you don't give up cricket, well, we're not going to look at drafting you. Well. You will. You'll still draft them if they're good. So that's my view is that don't let others tell you what, you, what your decision on what career path you're going to take. Mate, that's a great point because especially people when they're like 15, 16, like you don't even know what you're doing at 18, 20, let alone at that age. So it is quite a lot of unfair pressure obviously placed on young people having to choose a sport. Yeah, it is. And that's my view is that is that other people are making decisions on what, what you should do. At the end of the day, what you, what you, should, what you do is what you've got to be happy with. It's the best thing for you. Right? So, yeah, I, I tend to say, and I say that to, to these dual sportsmen, talented sort of kids, that, yeah, it's not up to someone else to tell you what to do. Yeah. Now, for our last little segment, the traditional last segment of the Where Do We Begin podcast, we'd like to have a little quiz. A quiz. A quiz. Okay. So, uh, and what, what are the stakes if I win, Precision Sports has to sign me? Yeah, exactly. Is that, <laughs> right. We'll be oh, targeting really the mid-season off. draft. We've got a, we'll have yeah. a proper meeting for this podcast. I'm really we, might, we might have to make it a Zoom meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, get you, I'll get a medical on you as well. You've got a, your eyes all cut there at the moment. <laughs> a little like Rocky Balboa. Well, we can put, put that on my draft profile. Courageous. Courageous. Team. Exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to pit, pit you, Liam, against you, Lockie. And yep. I've got five questions that are all – have some vague connection to you and your career. Okay. So, uh, right. yep, five questions uh, as per tradition. Is it first with, in? Yeah. Oh, your name is your buzzer, of course. Oh, okay. I've been forgetting to say that one recently. Yep. Your name is your buzzer. Yep. So, uh, as per tradition, we'll start with question one. So, of course, your initials, LP. So, which Italian has the initials LP and is considered by many to be the greatest opera singer of all time? <laughs> Uh, my buzzer will be number one draft pick in the 2021 <laughs> AFL draft. Um, pass. Pass? <laughs> Liam, do you want to have a shot? I was chatting to some people. They thought uh, – I went with this question because I thought one of you might get it. But... A singer? Nah, I've not really across them. Pavarotti? Ha- first name? Can you give me a first name? I can't. Luigi? <laughs> yeah, I was thinking <laughs> of Luigi too. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'll, I'll, for the first time in the history of Where Do We Begin, I'll give you a half point. Half point. Luciano Pavarotti. Luciano. Give, him, give him a full point. He got, he got the last name. That's important. I'll give, him, I'll give him a half yeah, point. Yeah, okay. I hadn't a given a lot of thoughts, so I'm, I'm one up. Yeah, oh, you're half point up. So, <laughs> half point. <laughs> so, Luciano Pavarotti. 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 <laughs> oh, my, I've got no idea. My geography's terrible. <laughs> it's closest to the pin, so just have a punt. Uh, 20 million. 20 million. Okay, lucky. Lucky. oof. Go over or under? Over or under, yeah, that's a tough one. I'm going to go... I think it'll be, it'll be less. 19, just to be safe. 
Lenium has got another point because it's thirty-seven oh, million. Oh wow! You eight hundred thirteen thousand. You have a that's right. Oh, wow. <laughs> he, that was trick in the book. He knew the answer to that. I he know, knew the he answer. Had no idea. And He's just knows, messing with you. No, I'm no good at yeah. geography. I, I thought it'd be smaller. <laughs> Tricky buggers these days. He's always always with stronger you. than my first. So. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. We'll have to finish strong. He has got a up. great history of coming back. It, okay, he's going to need to. One and a half, not two. So. Okay, well, it's still, <laughs> he's going to need three to beat me. <laughs> so, question three. Uh, of course, you uh, debuted on the 15th of July, 1989, mm-hmm. and something else that happened on the 15th of July in another year uh, was a social media platform launching. So, which social media platform? LP. Pick is. I'll say Facebook. Incorrect. I haven't even given it to you yet. I'll finish off the question. Which social media platform was launched on the 15th of July, 2006? Lachlan, I'll go MySpace. MySpace is incorrect. Oh, <laughs> <man>. <laughs> you, listeners, you should have seen him there. He was gritting from ear to ear. He was looking wins. forward to getting his oh, first yeah, point. Really? But the answer is Twitter. Oh. Yeah, well, yeah, that makes sense. There you go. It yeah. does make sense because it's yeah. the correct answer. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're right. I'm going to drive by now. <laughs> uh, question four. So, of course, uh, co host of Off the Bench. Speaking of Off the Bench, we're not talking about me and Lockie here because we start all our games on the bench. <laughs> one of the best shows on radio, that one. Yeah, cracker, cracker. Tune in on Saturday mornings on SEN, all you guys out there. If you're not already, I don't know why you'd be tuning into this if you're not tuning into Off the Bench. But anyway, question four. For how many seasons was the AFL's green vest, red vest substitute rule in place? Lockie. Lockie. I'll need an exact answer. It's not close. This is the pin. Uh, so it's 2011, 12, 13, 14, 15. I reckon, I don't know if 16, I don't reckon there was a sub in the 16 grand final, so I'll go five years. Spot on. You got the years as well. Oh, Very nice. Well one point. One point. Uh, one and a half to one. One and a half to one. Is <laughs> it's free flowing, high scoring There's affair here. Question. Is there one question left? There is one question left, yeah, but. You're going to need to nail this. <laughs> as we know, uh, Liam, you clearly haven't listened to the show before. Not many people have, so it's not that surprising. Uh, <laughs> I, haven't, I actually have to admit I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the last question of the quiz is always a who am I question. So, I'm going to go from five points yep. all the way down oh, to I... one point, give you a series of clues. Yeah, okay. Uh, all leading to who I am, of course. And once you've buzzed in and go to incorrect, which one of you probably will do considering your form, uh, you can't buzz in again until the other person gets it wrong. Okay. Yeah. So, by the way, when Merv did this, um, I went in early and got it wrong. So he did not answer. Yeah. We got to the last point, so I had no chance of coming back in because he was like, oh, he's, yeah, he's, he was like front. Merv. Don't give him ideas. He mate. likes winning. He likes winning, Mervin. <laughs> he does love winning. He was getting There's no real upside just up. getting five. You only need to get three. Oh, mate. Oh, no, I only need one. You only need one to win. Yeah, yeah. So whoever gets a point has won it, really. So I could be reading out this for a long time. So to start off with five for five points, uh, you were born on September 9th. Is that correct? Yep. Uh, for five points, I was born on September 9, 1966 in New York City, the home of the second famous Central Park, second most famous <laughs> Central Park, of Art course. Store, of course. <laughs> yeah, of course. Right, um, keep going. I've got nothing. For four points, early in my career in 1987, I played Theo Huxtable's friend Smitty in The Cosby Show. I'll move on to three points. Hang That's on, probably hang a bit on. tough. Yeah. Oh, you want to have a crack? Yeah. Keep going, yeah. Keep going, okay. For three points, I first took to comedy club stages at my brother's urging when I was 17. I've since appeared in 70 films and 16 TV shows and have reached a net worth of, get this, 540 million Aussie dollars. Ooh. Keep going, I've got no. Keep going, okay. For two points, in 1989, I was discovered by comedian Dennis Miller who recommended me to Saturday Night Live producer Lorne Michaels. I wrote and starred in the show for six years in the 90s before making a return as host in 2019. Lockie. Lockie. Oh, wait. Oh, wait. Oh, hello. Oh, okay, okay. I've said before you could pull out if you don't actually give an oh, answer. Wow. You pull out? Okay. So born in 66. Born in 66. Okay. Yeah. yeah, okay. So, and Saturday Night Live and he's worth yeah. a lot of money. Yeah. Uh, so for one point, this is it. Yeah. Get a bit of a drum roll going maybe. Put the sound effect in later. For one point, I share my initials with someone who was a drought-breaking premiership swan and St Kilda small forward and where do we begin episode 13 guest, as well as history's most famous bodybuilder. Share- Liam. Liam. <laughs> I'm Schwarzenegger. I-, I share my initials. With- oh, no, 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 no. I'll give you a shot. I'll give you a no, shot. I'll give you a shot. 
I'll, I'll give, give you another shot. That was yeah. It shares his initials with Arnold Schwarzenegger. So, yeah, okay. Comedian born in '66. So he shares an initial, so he's AS. Ah, yes. I know you're talking about Adam Schneider as the Ford. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Liam, Liam, Adam Sandler. He's got it. Oh, wow. <laughs> I shouldn't have got the, to be <laughs> fair, I shouldn't have got the, the uh, I shouldn't have got the clues after I went early, but yeah. I'm taking well, it. I'm taking well, it. Yeah, that, there's going to be outrage on social media win. about that. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Lockie's going to go, go I mean, fisty yeah, cuffs with Liam after the show. <laughs> yeah, that would probably should have finished me, to be fair. But. Uh, absolute pleasure Good for win. coming on, Liam. It was a lot of fun. One, one more question. So oh, you've forgotten again. The charity, of course. Oh, of course. Liam, I hear you've got a charity for us that you'd like to nominate uh, for it. Uh, as we do on every show to encourage guests, uh, sorry, not guests, listeners to yep. donate. Okay, well, Macaulay House for me. It's okay. uh, it's uh, they're doing great things out in the west for families that have been uh, affected by home, you know, violence and whatever. So for mums and kids and that sort of stuff. So yeah, Macaulay for me. Yeah, sweet. So we'll uh, plug all the websites and the socials of Macaulay House in the outro of the show, but. Other than that, Lockie, you got anything else for him? Thanks so much, William. It was an absolute pleasure. Good to have you boys, or good to chat with you boys, and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for that, William. It was so much fun having you on, and we really appreciate your generosity of giving us your time. Yeah, yeah. And speaking of generosity, the charity of the week, of course, uh, Liam mentioned Macaulay House. So uh, also known as, actually as the Macaulay Community Services for Women. So, Lockie, can you tell us a bit about them? Yeah, it's a really great foundation that really, I guess, helps um, keep people safe from family violence by, you know, offering housing for women, employment support and giving children a voice. It's a great foundation and I'm super stoked that we get to support it this week. Yeah, yeah, it is great. And it's like purpose-built, safe and stable long-term accommodation only for women. So victims of domestic violence, homelessness, Anything like that really provides great social uh, environment for them to make new friends and just be safe, really. So you can check them out. You can donate, fundraise, or even volunteer for them. You can check them out at macaulaycsw.org.au. So that is M-C-A-U-L-E-Y-C-S-W.org.au. I'll say that one more time. M-C-A-U-L-E-Y-C-S-W.org.au. Check them out. Make sure you get around them, our listeners. As we know, the listeners get around the podcast. We'd just like to thank you so much for uh, all the support and we look forward to another episode next week. Yeah, keep giving us that support because we love it more than anything and give us a bit of feedback. Get in touch with us on the socials. Of course, we mentioned in the show, WDWB Pod. Thanks for listening, guys. See you next Monday with another belter. Thanks so much.